Okay, good. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is uh, welcome to this session, which is um, a collaboration between the advocacy working group of the Alliance and the partners of the Unprotected series, which is the annual child protection and humanitarian action funding analysis, which is conducted every year by the Alliance, Save the Children, UNHCR, and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Um, there's quite a team behind this session. Um, and I would like to welcome our presenters and facilitators. My name is Elspeth, and I work on partnerships and advocacy in the Alliance Secretariat's team. And I'm, I'm joined here today by Marcello Viola, who is the Global Protection Advisor at Street Child and co-lead of the Alliance's Advocacy Working Group, who's co-facilitating with me today. Uh, we have our speakers, Steve Miller, Global Director of Child Protection at Save the Children International, uh, Jessica Stewart Clark, Child Protection Officer with UNHCR, and Ron Powells, uh, the coordinator of the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge support from my wonderful facilitators from Susanna Davis and Maria Marina Capriola. So thank you so much, team. Um, so oh, hang on, I have the I have the controller of the slide. Mm. Okay, great. So a quick overview of the session. Um, I'll provide a very brief background of the Unprotected series. Um, and then I'll have our partners here present some of the emerging findings uh, for this year's funding analysis, which looks at child protection funding in 2023. Um, and then we'll do some group work on sort of validations of the findings and your input on some of the key recommendations and messaging that we should be, we should be um, relaying as a sector. So it's a great moment because we're in the process of finalizing this, of the report and we're able to get all of your inputs as we, as we, as we um, bring it over the finishing line. So it's a great opportunity. Um, so before, on the next slide, uh, before I go into this, can everyone stand up, please? <laughs> Fantastic. I think it's after, this is the third back-to-back -back session, so it's good to get everyone moving. So um, I would like to ask you to please stay standing up if you have heard of the unprotected funding report. If you've never heard of it before, sit down. Interesting. And you can be honest, we will not be offended in any way. Okay, um, so please stay standing up if you have ever used any elements of the Unprotected series findings in your day-to-day -day work or advocacy efforts. If you haven't, please sit down. <laughs> can be honest. <laughs> Marcello, did you just sit down? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. That really helps us to have a read of how familiar people are with the report. So I just give a very, very quick recap. Um, so it's we're now in our fifth edition, soon to be launched. So it started in 2019, and it provides an analysis of child protection funding in the previous year. Um, generally, it's based upon an analysis of the OCHA financial tracking system, which I think many of you are familiar with. Um, but also this year, we're also getting some data from the refugee, is it called the refugee financial tracking? Is that the RFT? That's the right. Okay, great. Um, however, it's definitely not without challenges. For many of you who are familiar with the, with the FTS, it's a voluntary reporting tool. So OCHA relies on donors, organizations, um, to basically input data into the FTS on their, on their funding. Um, however, we believe that the importance of this funding analysis by far outweighs some of the challenges which we have with, with the funding analysis. Um, it provides an important advocacy tool for us as a sector. Um, it helps us raise a flag on the importance of child protection as being life-saving, life-sustaining. Um, it's good for us as well to be able to track our efforts and to see how resourced we are as a sector. So it's a very good accountability tool. 
and we've actually seen improvements in the tracking system, like massive improvements since we started. So when we started, it was really difficult to actually find child protection funding in the FTS. We had to actually do a keyword search and pull up the projects which had child protection in the title. This has definitely improved and we don't do this anymore. We can find child protection funding tagged under child protection. And the biggest change that we've seen is this in 2023 it's the first time we could actually see how you can actually see the breakdown of multi-sector funding which we could never see before so now if a project has nutrition wash and child protection each of the three lines are reported separately into the fts so we have a much clearer picture of actually how much funding is going into child protection which is great and we spoke to the FTS folks last week, and they've also said that there's been a huge surge in what's being reported. So over the years, like they're getting much more thorough reports. I read something like 20 years ago, it covered just a handful of responses, and now it's a system which is really getting much more thorough. So we're great. That's sort of where the analysis comes from. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, as you can see the fifth edition is coming very soon we're very excited we're finalizing it as you speak um, but our um, partners are now going to share with you some of the emerging findings we are not expecting any major changes in sort of what we're presenting to you the numbers might shift slightly and also to flag the fts is a is a is a working tool so it actually is being updated as we speak so it's still receiving funds now for 2023 so i think in 2023 an additional 8 billion was reported throughout the year for 2022 so we can kind of expect this by the end of the year as well so i'll stop there and hand over first to steve who's going to speak to some of the emerging headlines for this year's report thank you awesome thanks elspeth yeah, I mean, just, just to get started, I think we're all really familiar with the deteriorating situation for children in many parts of the world and the rollback of child rights that we've seen over the last few years. And we are all struggling to attract the funding that we need to do our work. And we are concerned about the effects this has on the quality of our programming and ultimately our impact. And we understand the situation to be one of a, of a widening gap uh, with needs on the graph shooting up at an exponential rate and the funding that we require not keeping place in the slightest. So what, what we're going to talk about today is sort of preliminary findings that Elspeth has reflected on. Um, so, it, you know, given these changes in reporting that happened with the FTS in, in 2023, it's going to be quite difficult to compare to previous years in many regards and sort of have that, that trend line all the way through. It's, it's for the better, the reporting's improved, so we have greater visibility. Uh, we understand more about donor behavior and where they're getting involved, which is awesome. Uh, but it is going to be a little bit difficult to compare. But most importantly, what, what we want to, hear from is, is from you you know what we're going to talk about today does it resonate with you and more importantly what are those key messages that we need as a sector to talk about this situation later today we have another session entitled how to do more with less unfortunately uh, and and there will be donors there too and this, it's good for us in these groups that we're going to get into to really think about what, what is it that we're seeing and how do we want to talk about it? And ultimately, everything will be pulled together for us to work on as we finalize the unprotected report. So let's start, oh, it's already up there behind me. This is the overall picture on uh, coordinated appeals. So what to recognize here, I suppose, is that we had going into 2023, record needs as well as record requirements and unfortunately we've also got a record low funding rate of 41 percent so that's on 57 billion worth of appeals and 23 billion funded and that compares to 2022 in which we had 59 percent so quite a quite a significant change there even though the trend line 
is as it is. So before we go to the next uh, uh, slide, it's, just, it's a fairly provocative one in some ways, so prepare yourself because it's unlikely to, to resonate with you, but this is it. This is child protection funding, um, and again, this is down largely to these changes in reporting. So it looks as though we've had this explosion of funding, whereas this is not the case, and that's, that's the detail that we want to get into with you. But you see 516 million uh, reported. So child protection is still disproportionately underfunded, sort of comes in at 2.5%. So some key findings before I hand over to my colleagues. Um, and some of these you, you'll be very, very familiar with, and we'll put a few numbers and details to it, Jessica and, and Ron, when they talk about the, the HRPs and the RRPs. Firstly, the, the variation between responses. There's great variation between responses and how they're funded, and also fluctuations over time within responses as well. So it's not, not a flat line. Uh, our main sources of income are still bilateral government donors, with the United States being far and away the greatest. And uh, we're seeing increases in, in EC funding. We have much greater visibility of donors now because of what Elspeth was talking about on the multi-sectoral funding. And so we're seeing, uh, well, increases perhaps, it's difficult to say that, but large contributions from the UK government, from Sweden, and from Netherlands, which is interesting. Uh, pooled funding, so pooled pool, pool funds have actually increased, but as a proportion of the total, they've decreased just because we've seen this rapid rise here. So they went from being around 10% of the total CP funding in 2021 to around 5% in 2023. And then finally, you know, the report unfortunately doesn't tell us much about funding to local and national uh, actors. Uh, it's really challenging to track this. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, sort of first tier recipients, LNAs, it's only at 2%, um, which, yes, is, is obviously deeply concerning. So finally, looking forward in 2024, we're, we're not going to concentrate on it in the session, but Ron, I, I believe, is going to say a few words around something called boundary setting and this idea that we've sort of had a ruthless prioritization that's been undertaken um, and our view of needs for 2024 is, is, is smaller um, when we as, as practitioners and people working in the space know this not to be the case. So those are, those are the highlights. Uh, I will now turn over to Ron uh, on HRPs. Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. So yeah, I'll give a bit more detail to the, to the numbers that were already mentioned by, by Steve. I mean, it's interesting to see, for example, that in, in HRP context, we see that there is an aver average funding coverage for child protection at 28.7% in 2023, which is an increase from the 19.8% we had in 2022. However, it remains still notably lower than the funding coverage of, of the HRPs in, in, in overall, which averaged 45% in 2023, which is actually a decrease in the overall funding from 61.2% from in 2022. Um, but it still indicates that in the HRP context, the humanitarian response plan context, child protection remains disproportionately underfunded when it is compared with other sectors. Um, as we could clearly see here, child protection needs and, and funding requirements um, continue to rise in 2023. Um, but it's, as, as Steve was saying, it, it's still uh, only represented 2.5% of total requirements. And we see a significant difference between um, these, between countries. Um, for example, child protection represented less than 1% of the total requirements in, in Chad, 0.8%, in Burundi, 0.1%, but more than 7% in El Salvador, seven, at 7.2%, in Colombia, at 76 
and in Burkina Faso at 8.2. We've also seen that in, in HRP context, only 1.7% of funding received for all HRPs went to child protection. So which further illustrates that funding for child protection in HRP context is far from meeting, meeting the needs. Um, the best funded appeals for child protection in percentage terms were found amongst HRP context, but child protection requirements were more than 50% funded in only three HRPs. Guatemala was funded 72%. Uh, State of Palestine 61.61% and Myanmar 52%. In amongst the HRPs where child protection funding rates were the lowest were Mali at 6% and Burkina Faso at 7%. So that means 94% and 93% underfunded. Um, in some HRP contexts, such as in Ethiopia and in Myanmar, child protection has become better funded over time. But in other contexts, such as in Yemen, DRC, Afghanistan, funding has fluctuated over time. For example, in the case of DRC, child protection fell from 53% funded in 2021 to 28% funded in 2022 and recovering in 2023 to 49%. Um, but the increases in funding rates, as was mentioned in, in 2023, may actually have been driven in part by these significant improvements in, in FTS. Um, as Steve was also saying, the main source of funding in, in uh, HRPs remains uh, government, bilateral government donors. Um, and um, we are able due to the improvement to see also the multi-sector programs uh, funded, which were not visible in the, in the past. Um, so while the total volumes of funding allocated to child protection from pooled funds fluctuate over time, um, we still see the pooled funds are contributing a declining proportion. Um, so we've seen a, a modest rise in terms of the of the quantity of the funding but not in the in the percentage so child protection remains still a very small proportion of of the surf funding with 1.3 percent of total uh, surf allocations going to you to child protection so to to summarize the needs and funding requirements continue to rise in hrp context we see the funding coverage for, H, uh, for child protection is increasing, but superior child protection remains disproportionately underfunded compared to other sectors. We also see in the HRP context that funding for child protection is far from meeting the needs. Our main source of funding remains bilateral government donors, and the pooled funds are contributing a declining proportion of overall child protection funding. Over to you for the refugee context. Thank you so much. So, colleagues, I promise I'm not on Instagram. I've got my notes on, on my phone, uh, not WhatsApping. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I want to speak to, to the refugee response plans. And I also want to, I want to try not to repeat anything you've already heard. So, do forgive me. Um, one thing that I wanted to start with, and I'm going to tell you something that you, you all know already, but it's mostly for dramatic effect, is really looking at the, the figures of uh, forcible displacement. So we know that we have over 62.5 million internally displaced people. We have over 36, 36.4 million uh, refugees. And by the first half of 2023, there were 6.8 million more displaced. So with these figures in mind, we know that there are record numbers in forcible displacement worldwide. There are devastating conflicts left, right and center, unfortunately. But most concerningly, the solutions are increasingly rare. And we're really trying to do, as you mentioned, we're trying to do more with less. But frankly, the needs outstrip what what we've got going very very few children and their families are able to safely return home and with more than 23 million refugees residing in protracted situations three quarters of all refugees 
are residing in low and middle income, middle income areas. So frankly, the world is just not keeping pace. The needs are growing every day. This is not news uh, to you. So we wanted to, you know, in this session, dig into, so what are, what are these needs? What are we asking for and what are we receiving? So we undertook a, a closer look at the refugee response plans. And um, as, as Elspeth mentioned and colleagues, is that the tracking on child protection requests for funding and the funding received were not necessarily systematically uh, or not very well organized in the, in the past. It's certainly Im improving. And for the refugee funding tracker, what we were not able to do is disaggregate what were we asking for specifically for child protection and what were we receiving specifically for child protection. It was all kind of lumped into the overall response. So this year, for the first time, we have really tapped into this absolute mountain of existing uh, data, looking at these RRP, RRPs and comparing this against our refugee funding tracker. We're digging into what does the child protection funding actually look like. And we're also doing this in the context of all our close collaboration on the unprotected report. There are mismatches, there are inconsistencies, um, there is incomplete data in both the FTS and the Refugee Funding Tracker. Indeed, sometimes it is wonderfully complementary. When we put these things together, we're getting a fuller picture, and other times it can be overlapping and sometimes it's not clear. But um, what we are seeing um, is interesting. And what we see is that when we compare the data that's coming out of the HRPs and coming out of the RRPs, we see that what is requested under HRPs and what is requested um, under the RRPs is relatively consistent. We also see that while what is actually received is relatively low, this too is relatively consistent. However, what was interesting was that we saw that refugee response plans are more funded than HRP over time. And we can see that consistently, that the refugee response plans, particularly when it comes to child protection, are more funded than the HRP. And we wanna know what's going on. We look to this in terms of the protracted situations. We look at this in terms of certainly fatigue, donor fatigue as well, and we look at this with the needs outstripping what we have available. So what's the good news? Well, we see that child protection is being funded. Although inadequately, we do see that while the, the gap of the funding for child protection was bigger than the overall gap. So for example, of the whole response plan, we saw that, you know, that uh, the, what, the gap between what was asked for and what was received was huge. The gap for child protection was always much, much bigger. But we do see that generally, this, this is remaining somewhat consistent. That gap for child protection is remaining consistent with the overall gap. It's no longer so disproportionate in the RRPs at least. Importantly, um, many of the appeals, or rather some of the appeals are very well funded, but many are not. And this links to what Ron was saying, is there's huge inequalities between what is funded and what's not. Among the RRP situations, what we see is that the funding coverage for the DRC, for South Sudan, and for Sudan is significantly low. It's below 20%. Additionally, for DRC and Sudan, the funding gap is much, much higher than the overall funding gap. In contrast, for Afghanistan and Syria, these situations have relatively higher funding the CP coverage is better, it's almost 40%. Child protection funding is a relatively modest component, as Ron mentioned as well, we see this in the HRP and in the RRP, that it's a relatively modest component of the overall ask. But what we do know is that it makes an enormous difference in the lives of children and their families, their parents, their caregivers, and their communities. What we do know is that child protection risks are predictable, that violence against children is preventable and that solutions are possible. We know this, we know this to be true. And what we see in UNHCR and with all our partners and within the Alliance is that we see what our operations and our partners on the ground are doing 
we see what they deliver with the funding that they do have, which is certainly insufficient across the board. But we see what they do do, and we see what they can do with what they have. So we know we can do more if we have more. And there's evidence to back that, that if we have better funded RRPs and HRPs, we can do more. And we can see that the work that we are doing, we are making an impact in the lives of children, their families, their caregivers, and their communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before I just um, uh, see if there are some questions from the floor, I am aware that we've just uh, bombarded you with a lot of data. <laughs> so just to summarize some of the key headlines. So overall humanitarian funding, the gap is increasing. And actually, although funding is still being reported for 2023, it's likely that there was a decrease in actual volume of funds compared to the previous year, okay? So that's number one. The second is child protection funding. It is likely based upon some kind of triangulation and analysis that we've been doing that there has been a slight increase, a slight, not a doubling as the graph showed, a slight increase in the volume of funding received for child protection noting the massive improvements in reporting. Um, however, the gap between the um, amount requested and the amount received is growing. On top of that, child protection across humanitarian response plans, as Ron pointed out, is disproportionately funded. All of the plans together received 40%. Child protection received 30%. This is different in the RRP context, in the refugee context, where it's roughly about the same and in some cases more. So it's a different story, but there's still massive underfunding. And then when we go inside the response plans, as you saw in the graphs, across HRPs and across RRPs, the story is pretty much the same. That there's a massive, um, there's a massive discrepancy in funding across plans a massive discrepancy. Um, and we're seeing that discrepancy doesn't only happen like between countries, but within countries, there are fluctuations on a year-to-year -year basis, which makes quality, child protection, predictable, life-saving programming extremely difficult. So that's essentially a quick sum of what our panelists have been, have been, um, have, have been providing you with a lot of data. And I would just like to ask before we move into our group work, if anyone has any questions, um, perhaps thinking about whether these findings resonate with what you're seeing in your context, your countries, your organizations, your operations. Thank you for this overview. It was really, really helpful. Um, I don't know if this is something we're going to be discussing maybe in the group work, but you know, you mentioned that some contexts you know, are more successful in their fundraising efforts for child protection, um, like Guatemala and Palestine, and some like Mali and Burkina Faso struggle more. And I was curious if you, I mean, this is the question, I guess, but like, why do you think, and um, you know, is it that the proposals that they're receiving are stronger? Is it that there are coordination structures in place in some contexts and not in others that are more strongly advocating for child protection needs? Um, you know, what some of the things that we hear from donors, you know, when we raise these issues is that they're not always getting proposals for child protection or that that isn't, um, you know, a lot of the funding decisions are made at country level, not at global level. So I was curious if you have any thoughts or insights on that, like if there are things we could learn from some of the countries like Guatemala, that sounds like they're doing um, a good job. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I think we'll take one more question here. I didn't see any other hands, but maybe. Yeah. Oh, one here. We'll take one, two, three, and then. Okay, thank you very much. I, um, I just wanted to raise that um, among the forgotten crisis, when we, when we mention the forgotten crisis, we forget <laughs> the sale crisis. So I need to say that because this is very important. 
I think there's critical underfunding. Our, the staff that is in the field is just completely overwhelmed and having actually mental health issues because when they have a little bit of funding, of protection funding, they, they, the needs are so huge. Sometimes they have, they see naked children. It's just like completely, uh, and I don't think it's because we don't write proposal. I think um, we need to stop following media. I think we need to be bold and uh, advocate because um, ha in 2030, half of the children uh, living in extreme poverty will be in West and Central Africa. And this is not uh, talking about the, the crisis. So I think there's definitely something that we need to do there. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this analysis. It's really super interesting. My question is about in the six years, five years, sorry, I should have paid more attention of the five. report. <laughs> Do you have a better sense through that reporting of why child protection is underfunded in comparison to other sectors? Is there feedback from the donor community on that? Do we know why they're consistently still not seeing this as a priority? And are there any examples of donors who've shifted um, their funding and have invested more over that period in child protection and an understanding of what might have contributed to that shift. Thanks. Thank you so much. One more question. Yeah, Thank, thanks for sharing uh, such very uh, interesting data and analysis. Um, my question is very simple. It is around the narrative about child protection proposals. We are talking a lot and we are discussing a lot about integration, but sometimes when we read the proposals, child protection is not clear over there. So thinking about the donor hat, what we have to increase or even give a better narrative on the proposals in order to increase the funding related to child protection and even in humanitarian response plans. Great, thank you so much. So <laughs> are there any questions? So the first question was around the inconsistency across for funding across HRPs. The second one on silent crises and the impact, especially on, on actual practitioners themselves as they're grappling with huge needs and underfunding. Third about, do we have a better understanding of underfunding and, and trends? And the fourth on our narrative and getting it right. So. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just start with one and I think people can probably fill in from their perspective as well. And I, I'm just speaking from the perspective of an INGO. I, I represent Save the Children, I suppose, and why we have this sort of unequal um, focus on various contexts over others. It, it's a complex picture and there's lots of reasons for it, I suppose. But if you, if you look at us, for example, last year in 2023, we actually had record institutional raise um, more than we've ever seen before. But what was going down was private income. And so we have a real problem there, particularly when it comes to URI and where we can invest. And so we, we end up chasing particular um, context just because there's more opportunities there, I suppose. We also have a very complex federated structure with members who have their own priorities and their own markets to speak to, and they know what resonates and what doesn't. And so it's very difficult for us to sometimes control that and have the focus where it should be. But it's certainly, I mean, as Amelie says, it's a massive concern for us to have these forgotten crises and, and areas where we can't raise significant funds for. So it's something we're constantly trying to address. Yeah, I'll try to, to answer some of it. I, it's interesting to... to um, <coughs> When we look at those those countries, some of it is expected in terms of if you're looking at West Africa, we all know it's a, the forgotten crisis, Mali, Burkina Faso. I think in the latest NRC report on forgotten crisis, I think Burkina Faso was again the number one in that uh, in that list. Um, and it's not because our team is not getting things together. I think if we're looking at Burkina Faso, for example. We've worked with them on situation monitoring. We've worked with them together with the global education cluster on joint needs assessment. So the data are there. 
the proposals are there. Is this, I guess, no interest to, to, to um, invest in it, in child protection in particular? The other thing also I've seen, um, and it was during my visit last year to, to uh, the Horn of Africa, is that in situations where there is a drought, um, we see that there is a disproportionate, I would say disproportionate, looking at it fr from a child protection angle, interest in, oh, we need to respond to it from a health, nutrition, food security, and wash perspective. So protection, including child protection, is completely out of the window. Um, and that's donors who are saying that, because we had, a, we had a call with donors on this, and they were saying, well, it's a drought, so we have to prioritize other areas. Um, but it's even our own agencies who are not fighting for, for child protection. And as looking at UNICEF, we, we lead four clusters, including the, the child protection AOR. But if we, within a humanitarian country team, we did not fight to get education and child protection on that agenda of the drought response. And so I think also within our own organizations, we need to get better to, to, to fight for, for, for child protection and to, to bring in that narrative of how children and their protection are affected by a drought as well. So it's, it's really about how do we strengthen and continue to strengthen our narrative. I'm not saying we're not doing it, but we probably need to, we need to do, we do need to do more. Um, and um, yeah, one of the things I've, I've heard speaking to, to donors as well in terms of how we're doing as child protection is that they were saying that they felt that we were very, in our proposals, we need to be much more, much better in explaining the context and pr writing a proposal that is specific to a country. They were saying they could not see a difference between a proposal from Burkina Faso and Mali. Um, because we, we didn't, apparently didn't do well in, in, in really emphasizing what was specific in terms of child protection for that, for that country. So based on that, they said, well, it's, I, could read, I could get the proposal from any other country, so why would I fund it? Because it seems like the team doesn't have any understanding of why and what's happening in the country. So for them, it wasn't something they would like to, to, to fund. So it's how do we get better in, in generating the data, analyzing it, and, and using it in, in our proposals? And that's why I think what's also important from, from a, an AOR perspective is it's good to fund and have coordinators in place, but we also need to make sure that we have these information management officers in place who could really help us with generate the data, analyze it, and then use it for our proposals to, uh, to, uh, to donors. Great, thank you so much. We're about to start the group work, so if you just wanted to take a minute. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do my best. I've just got a, I've just got a couple of things. Um, it, I hope that um, in my attempt, I might answer some of the, the, the different questions as well. But I just wanted to add on to what Stephen Ron had mentioned. One of the things that we, we really need to get to grips with, and I, I, actually there's a dedicated session on this tomorrow, is around uh, needing needs assessments and similar. We have a whopping amount of data at our disposal. Um, anyone who has worked in the field for any level of time, you know that we are forever collecting and processing data for a million different reasons. It is needs assessments, it's rapid assessments, it's this, it's that. We also do a huge amount of data collection in our day-to-day -day jobs and child protection from an attendance register to actual case management data. We have a huge amount of information on what the real situation is for children, their families, their caregivers and their communities that we simply don't use. It's not necessarily because we don't know how to use it. I think it's because we often don't have the time, quite frankly. But one of the things that we really need to do better at as an entire community, as an alliance, as all the partners, is to put the data that we have to work. And we need to make this accessible to each other, that you are able to see data that is coming from UNHCR in Namibia, 
for example, on what the child protection risks are in this country from Save the Children, from UNICEF, from wh wherever it is, in an easy, easily accessible format so that you can put that data to work in your proposals. One of the things, and there's going to be a bit of a shameless punting here, so forgive me, UNHCR undertook a child protection data analysis on everything that we had on child protection over a period of six years. What we see is that child protection risks are absolutely predictable, that we know what the child protection risks will be for forcibly displaced children. We need to do better at taking what we know and packaging it and presenting it clearly in our proposals and to our donors. We do not need to have very, very country context specific information right now to tell you what the risks will be in a situation of forcible displacement. We know and we have the data and we can speak confidently about it. So it's really on the story we're telling and the data that we're using it. And I promise I'm going to wrap up in like one second. Um, but I just wanted to, more shameless punting, the UNHCR child protection policy. When you were speaking about priorities, we're talking about integration, we're talking about the needs outstripping what we have. What we see over and over is everyone telling us you've got to do more with less. In a many places, this is simply not possible. I was in Chad at the end of last year. My colleagues, there were two child protection staff in UNHCR that were covering the existing crisis and the new influx. They, the population of concern of, of forcibly displaced and stateless people that they were responsible for had risen by 87%. And they didn't have any more staff, they didn't have more partners, and they were trying to cover case management for the existing caseload and the new caseload with exactly the same resources. Frankly, it's not possible and it's irresponsible. So when we are working on what are our priorities, we need to really get super, super real about what can we actually do and what can we do well? What must we do? What is our comparative advantage? How can we supplement? How can we bring other people in? We cannot do everything, and I think we have to stop trying because we are stretching ourselves too thin. We're trying to mainstream everything, and I'm a big proponent of mainstreaming, but we really need to look at what do we need to do in child protection? What must we do? What can we do with what we have? And speak to our donors about what can we do if you give us more? We can meet more children's needs. So if we have this amount of budget and we can do just this, give us even half of that, we can do more. And that's the story that we need to be telling much more clearly. I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for these insights. Thank you. Oh, we have a <laughs> I think we have some very strong calls for action here, and it's very much linked to a session we'll be having later this afternoon. Um, but I could hear already emerging ideas from this group, so I really want to harness some of the inputs that we have in the room now. We have 15 minutes until the end of the session. So it would be great now if we could go into groups um, and it would be great just to reflect in your group on the findings that we have just shared related to child protection funding and really think in your group, what are the really key recommendations, messages that we should be relaying as a sector? If you had to leave this room now and give your CEO a briefing or a donor a briefing about global child protection funding, what would be your key messages based upon this? So, Joanne, I'm really, really sorry to interrupt the really rich discussions you're having. So can I just have, I'm sorry. Um, it's actually lunchtime now. Um, oh, um, it's actually lunchtime now. I'm really sorry because I know you're having super rich discussions. So I just wanted to say that I'm going to close the session and say that all of the recommendations and things you're talking about, we're going to capture. We're actually writing the report as, as you speak. So we really hope that we're able to really kind of harvest from you here some inputs into shaping our narrative. But we hope it doesn't end here. So please do reach out to me and to Marcello, join our advocacy working group and do keep engaging. It's really important that this report is owned by all of you and that we're building this narrative together. If you want to stay fit to finish your discussion, please feel free um, but lunch is being served downstairs and we we'll start again uh, this afternoon at uh, 2 thank you very much